Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I don't think that the legendary Kate A.D. needs uh, an introduction. If there is anyone uh, here who doesn't know her, uh, I would be quite surprised. I'd be quite surprised if they also spoke English. Um, I think uh, I, we were talking before uh, we got started. I told her I thought of us for this interview as a kind of um, Morecambe and Wise, and my role was Ernie Wise to feed lines to Eric Morecambe, and she would be <laughs> she would do the Eric Morecambe part. So, and that's how I intend to to play it. Um, we do have a bond of sorts because uh, I was very interested to find that we're both Irish uh, by ethnicity. Part. I'm part. Part really. Irish. I'm whole <laughs> Irish, uh, unless you want to exclude Norman Irish from the inheritance, because it's only been there for a thousand years. Um, but uh, I think your um, Irish part is a bit more exotic than mine, Kate, so perhaps well, we I'm, could lead in that way. I, I, I suppose I'm the result of the consequences, one of the very smaller consequences of the Second World War, um, in that um, uh, my mother had me um, as a result of an affair uh, just at the end of the war, and I was adopted. And I was one of tens of thousands. Uh, the war was a disrupting uh, element in more than just military ways, uh, families. Th one of the statistics I found fascinating res when researching uh, about adoption and also uh, about abandoned children, which I wasn't, but um, about all of that kind of... Uh, what you might call disrupted background, was that in 1946, apart from trying to rebuild uh, the country, the government was faced with the fact it had the largest percentage of divorces that occurred in the 20th century, and that is before the divorce um, reform bill came through 20 years later. They genuinely thought the nation was going to fall apart. And uh, I was one of those sort of causes of their concern. <laughs> Uh, in those days, of course, adoption was automatic. Women did not keep their children um, it, when they were born out of wedlock. And I was an adopted child brought up in northeast England. Uh, a very happy childhood. Uh, we were always told, my generation of adopted children, um, that we chose you, which was an extraordinary reassuring and rather flattering phrase uh, that made you feel that you hadn't been abandoned. Instead, you were rather special. And it was splendid. And I had a lovely childhood on the northeast coast of England and was brought for holidays to People's Hypo, yeah, <laughs> where I remember running wild and having the most wonderful time. So I had a childhood with no regrets in that direction. Uh, I'm not saying that every adopted child has that uh, experience. On the other hand, children brought up with their natural parents often do not have a happy childhood. But mine was in no way, um, uh, it was one of those conventional, uh, quiet, we've had the war, dear, we want peace. It was an, a very interesting attitude, and I look back to, that people did not want disruption. They didn't want too much excitement either. They'd had too much for six years. I was absolutely fascinated when we talked about this last night by your account of um, middle-class Wesleyanism <laughs> and uh, working-class uh, uh, Wesleyanism and bottom of the dump mission Wesleyanism. I wonder if you'd like just to uh, explain to us again how that worked well, in your I part of England. Hugely, um, I didn't have a hugely religious um, background uh, in, in the sense that uh, it was only years later that I met Methodists who didn't drink. Oh, I was terribly surprised by that, um, because in Sunderland, the nonconformists who ruled the roost and the Church of England had to take a back seat as a very minority sect. And there were Baptists and Congregationalists and Wesleyans, and there were all sorts. And it was also a del delineation of class. Um, the middle class me Methodists all went to church. The working class went to chapel. And the completely and utterly desperate derelict were missioned to down the East End near the shipyards. It was a curious town of, um, quite a large town, uh, which was declining then. It had been the biggest shipbuilding town in the world. I mean, all the parallels with the Clyde in a way, but not as successful, not as long lasting. There were all the parallels with those areas of mining where the pits were going and eventually closed. And all our heavy industries disappeared. And now what is left is a shell 
of a 19th century town. And I was somewhere in the middle of that, in mid-century and onwards, but it did give me a feel for um, social history, for how things change and how the environment shifts. And um, uh, this curious business uh, that also, I was rooted in one town. I never understood people who lived in London. How could you know everybody? We felt in Sunderland that we did know everybody, and I'm afraid that was rather shown by the time I, I trolled into Sarajevo one day in the middle of the Bosnian War, and there was a new um, NATO uh, unit in town, British unit, and it was uh, one of the um, old outfit that used to be called the Durham Light Infantry. And I came in my armored wagon down one of the roads in Sarajevo, and there was a large armored vehicle in front of me, and there was a whole load of lads who saw the BBC on the front of it, painted on the front of it, they were going, I thought, oh, problems here. Stopped dead, got out of the car, and one bloke shouted from the top of the um, armored vehicle, your kid Eddie from Sunderland, my mum used to sell your mum fish. <laughs> and, uh, it was a small town in many ways. Wonderful. And you haven't mentioned the, the Irish community who are not nonconformist. Uh, the I mean, and there, there, thereby hangs a sort of curious background for the useful things in, um, uh, in, 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 in reporting, in that you learned a little bit about sectarianism. Uh, the Wesleyans and the, you know, the Congregationalists and uh, all the others ruled the roost. The Catholics were Catholics. Indeed, when I went to parties when I was a teenager, you'd come back and you'd say, I met a lovely guy, God, nice boy, good looking. And there'd be a pause and a voice might say, they're Catholics, you know. <laughs> and you learnt that people were divided or could be divided in that way. It sounds very old fashioned now, but at least it gives you some idea that the divisions which we are seeing today which are leading to terrible violence and differences, those differences in belief go deep and can cut deep as well. So it was a good lesson. Good. Well, I think most of us think of you as, um, more than anything else, as a foreign, daring foreign, foreign, foreign correspondent on the, on the front line. How did you get into journalism? I, uh, not, not by a completely I, direct route. I, I didn't go to gen journalism at ever. My, my, my headmistress would have rolled in her grave that I actually took up a job from my nice girl's school in, in, in Sunderland, um, which would involve, you know, interviewing men without having been introduced to them before. Yeah. Uh, there would have been a, a sense that it was not at all a job for uh, a woman. And indeed it wasn't when I came out of university. But I came out of university with one of the odder degrees. Um, I am one of the few people, I can be challenged on this, no, uh, that has a degree in Swedish and ancient Icelandic. <laughs> Due to having uh, somewhat stuffed up my um, A-level exams and uh, having been pushed by my headmistress. Oh, it's not the Northeast Nordic. Uh, well, you could claim that. No, it wasn't that at all. It was the headmistress had to find someone who had a few spare places on the course. <laughs> and so I went in via the cat flap to university round the back uh, without any of the qualifications um, and found myself um, learning Swedish, which when you actually exit with a degree in Swedish, my beloved professor, who was a marvelous Scot who came um, from uh, uh, up river um, from Aberdeen, right up uh, in woods and forests, and whose parents, he once told us, had actually been illiterate a fascinating man who spoke 38 languages and was one of the great experts on uh, Germanic languages in this country. And a wonderful, down to earth, and, and, and marvelously entertaining lecturer who taught us as much as he could whenever you showed you knew, knew nothing about anything. And particularly, you even remarked, you know, that um, I remember one day somebody broke a chair in the, in, you know, chair leg went. And someone said, well, I don't know how to mend that. At which he said, right, wood turning and carpentry are ancient. And off he went. He knew everything about everything. We got taught everything about everything and not a great deal about the actual course. Uh, but he was wonderful. And towards the end of my, um, you know, degree, I was thinking by then I'd got around to the idea of a job, which I hadn't at the beginning. Girls didn't bother too much about careers. 
when I left school. Nobody thought of telling you, you know, to pursue something. You just did a little shorthand and typing, dear, unless you were a blue stocking and became a teacher, perhaps. And towards the end of it, you know, there I was, you know, getting my degree in Swedish and ancient Icelanding, and he said, without dropping a beat, he said, Miss Heedy, he said, <coughs> you, I predict, will become a national treasure should the Vikings ever invade us again. <laughs> so, <laughs> armed with that, I had to head out into the job business and sheer serendipity coinciding with the expansion of the BBC into local radio, which was then an experiment, shows you how long ago. Um, I applied to the extraordinary, uh, good, by extraordinary good luck, to what was going to be um, a local radio station in my own northeast. And so I thought the one thing I've got going for me is I'm local. What I haven't got going for me was any knowledge about radio, anything except having listened to Children's Hour forever uh, and that sort of thing. And I really didn't know what I was in for. And I was desperate by then for a job of any sort. And it was still, it was written on my BBC form, which they kept as evidence for forever, which said, when Miss Adie was asked what she was prepared to do, she replied, anything. I really wanted a job. And it turned out to be quite prophetic because what I did end up doing in some ways, news is about anything and is hugely varied. I didn't go into news. I joined local radio. Uh, for my sins, I became the producer of the kind of local thought for the day, down your way, though they had different phrases. Up your parish pump, I think we called one of them. But... Um, <laughs> And uh, I also became the farming producer. I knew nothing about it. Um, I was landed on by the uh, um, station manager who said, somebody around here must know something about agriculture. It was a dozen of us. That's all. Tiny local radio station. Nothing. Nobody lived on a farm. We're all little townies in the, north, in the industrial northeast. I said, right, who likes animals? I became a BBC farming producer. <laughs> I went around the local agricultural show in absolute desperation, and my research, which I have to tell you was absolutely spot on, uh, was achieved by clutching, anybody of a certain age will remember, the I Spy Book of Sheep, <laughs> which had pictures. That's known as research. And I learnt. I made all my mistakes on local radio. It was experimental. We were rather near our audience. People used to ring in. If they didn't like things, they used to ring up and threaten to come round. <laughs> so you learnt about what not to say on air, what you had to do. You learned about the variety of people. You never knew quite who you were going to bump into, what was going to happen. You learned how to interview people who were shy, frightened, inarticulate, overawed, bumptious, difficult, <laughs> evasive. You learned the hard way. And it was the most wonderful training. I talk about it because everything I learned in local radio, I used. Why, when I ended up in um, difficult situations, in very much bigger and significant broadcasting situations. I was pulling on all of those things because people are the same anywhere. And the interaction, when you're trying to interview someone whose house has just been shelled and is sitting in a state of mild shock but wants to talk about it, and there is also the fear that another shell may come in. And you have to say to yourself, we have limited time. I must not alarm this person. I mustn't take advantage of their situation and their shock. But if she wants to tell me what it was like, I've got to phrase this and use my voice and my body language to let her speak to me and for her story to come out. All of that came from interviewing people back in Durham. About farming. Uh, in the middle of Bosnia, this involves my lovely colleague, Martin Bell. 
uh, the two of us, um, we'd come across each other because we'd worked different areas. He was in Sarajevo, I was in central Bosnia when the fighting was raging, which was three-sided between Croats, Serbs, and Bosnian Muslims, all fighting each other. A confused, desperate situation. We were living for the time in a barn. Uh, you took what you had. There were no hotels. Um, everything was burnt out. There were no ordinary shops. We were, it was a sort of superior cam camping with rather sort of risky attitude. And we were living in a barn for a bit in this little clutch of houses. And uh, the nice um, farmer and his wife, elderly, who lent us the barn, which was nice and warm, had lots of straw, and also had a nice lot of goats. It was a sort of movable hot water bottle at night. And there we were in this place, and one morning Martin came to see me terribly worried, and he sort of said, you know, the, the farmer's been injured. We've just managed to get some people to take him. There was some shelling overnight, and he was out and got hit by something. And he, he, I said, OK, has that been sorted? Uh, you look very worried. He said, no, I'm worried. I said, what about him? He said, no, no, he's all right. You see, have you heard the noise? I said, what? He said, eh, 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 eh. it's all happening, you know, in the barn. You know, I went and I said, well, Martin, you know, it's our goats. And he said, why are they making that noise? And Martin, I said, Martin, they need milking. And milk, Martin said, my God, I said, Step forward, a BBC farming producer. I asked you uh, when we were having a cup of tea uh, a while ago about, um, if you like, you, you know, most dramatic situations. Uh, uh, I think you told me that the one that made the most impact on you was Tiananmen Square. Well, it still does. I mean... <laughs> It's often luck that takes you to places. There's no crystal ball that journalists have. Nobody tells you, by the way, in two days, there'll be this immense event. It's a frequently luck. It was in the Iranian embassy siege, the first very big story I did. I ended up live on television when the SAS went into the Iranian embassy to break the siege. And I was merely the overnight junior reporter who'd been called in early that day, a, f a six day siege, and been called in early because the more senior correspondent wanted to go off to a dinner party. He never spoke to me again, actually, it has to be said. It wasn't my doing, but I was called in. And so luck, in Tiananmen Square, I was, I think, the 11th correspondent in three and a half months of demonstrations in Beijing. People have forgotten because of the end of it, what the beginning was, and this huge, great, extraordinary showing of students, citizens, all sorts of people. There they were in Tiananmen Square um, from early spring onwards, causing the government endless anxiety and fear. <coughs> and the whole demonstration ebbed and flowed over the weeks, and eventually correspondents left, correspondents got tired, one lost his voice, and. I eventually, right on the end of a long string, they sort of said, well, we're running out of people. AD, get on a plane to, um, to China. So I did. And I got there at the end of May, in this beautiful summer in uh, Beijing. And a matter of days later, uh, the Chinese Politburo took the decision to end the demonstration <laughs> in the most um, precise way they thought uh, was efficient, and that was to send not one but two armies in just before midnight down one of the huge long avenues towards Tiananmen Square. And not content with having lied about the fact that, uh, to the soldiers, that there were foreign insurgents, fighters, and bad elements only threatening the actual Chinese Republic by causing a revolution and starting some kind of riot in the square. And all the students were unarmed and the ordinary citizens were there. They told the soldiers that the whole city was at risk. And so they fired from lorries with um, long range rifles and quite a bit of heavy duty stuff, small arms, all the way in for 20 miles. Ordinary citizens on the pavements. People who were woken by noise who got up and went to have a look. They were the people who were killed. 
There was a slaughter of innocent people. By the time we got there, just before 12, we saw the first trucks rolling in. We had absolutely no concept of what was happening. This is a city. These were peaceful students. We'd left most of them asleep on their little blankets and under the tents in Tiananmen Square. Um, we're in a side street. We were about 200 yards from the end of the main alley, and we could hear this roaring sound of lorries coming down. And people were wandering up, rubbing their eyes with sleep on this hot night, having gone to bed early, from the little houses, the hutongs. And they were standing, and two were standing either side of me, and my cameraman was over by a tree wondering what was happening, just looking around. And people were wandering out, and the two either side. And you do, when you don't speak the language, and you go, hoping someone will give you some. And I went like that to one of the men, then to the other. And he wasn't there. He was dead on the ground. And I looked at the other one, and he too was on the ground. There had been two bullets past me. It, it was inconceivable. It's not how... Even warfare is conducted. This is the middle of a city. And these are ordinary little guys who've just got out of bed and are standing looking down their main street outside their house. And they're being killed. I mean, the, the night escalated. We got to a hospital. We saw large numbers of people, huge numbers. And it was an apocalyptic sight, and it was an army professionally slaughtering whoever came in their gun, gun sites. And we stayed out longer than you normally reckon. Now, what do you mean by normally? Because this applies to all dangerous, risky situations. How long do you stay out? How long? Nobody's going to tell you. There's no line in the sand. There's nobody who puts up a, you know, a notice saying, you know, it's going to get really dangerous and you're not going to get the story back. Because our job as reporters is to bring the story back, not become the, the story and be involved in it. It's to get the story out. And there was an added element in China. I knew, though I'm no sinologist, but I knew enough about the history and the present, uh, the regime, to know that they would lie about it. This would not happen. They'd rewrite history. I knew that then. They've done it time and again, and I knew they would. And there was no other camera crew. Everybody was back in the hotel, two hotels near the square on the balconies. We were out on the streets for five hours, and we got the footage, not without a lot of difficulty. There were also secret policemen. But there were wonderful Chinese, total strangers to us, who helped us, protected us, took us places. I remember it because it's the one story out of, I think, several, over 3,000, someone one, once calculated that, out of 3,000, that I feel still resonates today because they still don't acknowledge what they've done. They're still lying. They're lying to the people who are still going to the authorities and asking, where is the body of their child? They've never, ever accounted for anything, and they've denied as well. And when people say, well, of course, they're changing, um, you know, it's a different, you say, well, they're not changed until they admit what they did. I feel that very strongly. And it's rare that a reporter gets to do something like that, where you feel impelled to take risks. It's very rare. Uh, it's the only story I can think where that we took a distinct decision to push it because we had to get the stuff out. But my job, as I say, is to get the stuff out. It isn't to stay there, take part, or do anything else. It's to bring it back. Mm. Thank you. Um, very gripping. Um, another um, of your encounters and stories that we discussed a little earlier was um, your meetings with uh, General Gadda sorry, Colonel Gaddafi. Uh, I only met him once, and I thought he was his manner was certainly a bit peculiar, uh, and he appeared to be waking, wearing makeup. Um, uh, and uh, I thought you might be interested in in Kate's response because it shows that um, appearances can be deceptive, possibly in in more way than uh, more ways than one. She's given very kind of nice 
um, almost pro Gaddafi explanations for these for the certain bizarre. Not pro Gaddafi at all. He was ignorant. He was not very well educated. He was taken into the army fairly early and got a very truncated education and then some military education. He hadn't travelled widely. The only place we ever discovered he'd ever been for a holiday was the Austrian Alps. I mean, when you think about it, that's one of the more bizarre things of Colonel Gaddafi arriving in one of his weird outfits. He was unsophisticated. That actually um, accounts for an enormous amount of the eccentricity. And not only was he unsophisticated, though, he held everybody else in abject terror of him. So nobody said, why are you wearing those daft clothes? So nobody advised him. I knew people who were, quote, advisors, foreign affairs advisors, a couple of them, there's a bit other people around him. And I said, did you ever tell him? Tell him, they say, tell him, I want to live. He was dangerous. I had one of his people telling me once very quietly, I said, you know, is he always so difficult? They said, capricious. He said, of course. He said, you should be there when there are Libyans only. The people he works with, the people who work for him, including some of his family, and he goes into a temper. He said, you can smell the fear in the room. People are rigid and daren't shake because he'll go for them. They lived in fear. But it was eccentricity lack of education led to the bizarre theatrical meetings in tents, mm -hmm. bizarre sunglasses looking like a sort of faded Italian fat film star, turning up dressed as an admiral in order to ignore, inaugurate a fishing boat. I mean, I remember all of these weird things. And there was capricious behavior. He, he, he used to speak for about seven hours at a go. So he wasn't as long as Castro, who holds the world record at 11 and a half hours, but he was not far behind some days. And he was in a theater once addressing things. We journalists were all sort of sitting there going, what is all of this about? And there were various chanting and yelling. Um, and he was having one of his anti-American rants. Um, and he was saying, everything American, he was saying in Libya, everything Americanski must go, everything. We do not want them. We do not need their films. We do not need uh, their people. We do not need their television. We do not need their cars. And he went on and on and on. After about sort of 10 minutes, I saw his, one of his, the head of his bodyguard arrive, who was a very interesting Berber, whom I knew. And he went up to him and he went, he was not afraid to go up to him. And he went, pssst. And get off he went, hmm? Ah, said Colonel Gaddafi, and started something else. Um, what had happened was that outside, his own cavalcade of cars included quite a lot of American ones, and everybody outside had set fire to them. <laughs> so the bodyguard was saying, could you possibly rescind that remark? Otherwise, we won't get home. <laughs> These theatrically bizarre occurrences were due to ignorance, to stupidity, and the fact that nobody would gainsay him. And it's difficult for us to understand that fear. It's very difficult to understand that you let people do such stupid things, but nobody dared say anything. He could be, he could be fatally vicious. He didn't like uh, flying, so when um, he used to go to the African Union meetings, including on the other side of the Sahara Desert, his cavalcade had to, had to, had to drive, uh, including with, with him. And he didn't like staying in hotels, so they had to bring tents for him to stay in a tent. Did you have any, in, oh, you also mentioned sand blindness as a possible explanation oh, for some of the, some of the. Well, this again is an, in, it, is an insight into the actual sort of physical state of him, which is never terribly good, because he was, um, the subject of five assassination attempts that I know of and had had a couple of bullets in him. So he was none too physically fit. Um, he had some blindness, which you get in the Sahara, which he got when he was a young, uh, stupid um, uh, soldier. And it affected him, which is why he used to sort of stand around like this, as if looking down his nose at people. It was because of his sight. He didn't have good sight. He lived on a very weird diet, which at one point um, consisted of dates, camel milk, and cake. Well, there you go. You don't get terribly fit on that. And he was a bit of a wreck in many ways. 
but again, difficult to get information about these things, but difficult to assess them, particularly for foreign journalists and for diplomats and people going in, because you got the theatrical show, which was deeply bizarre each time. I have to tell you that the journalists who only used to see him because he was an owl, not a lock. In other words, the press conference, which was scheduled for 7 p.m. in the evening, was reckoned to start around 3 a.m. And we used to sit for hours and hours. Some of us used to take cards, read a book, gossip. And the main thing we did was lay bets. And we used to lay bets on what he'd be wearing, whether he'd turn up as suave Mr. Italian in the sort of Gucci suit. Uh, with the sort of polished shoes, the pointy shoes, whether he'd be admiral of the Libyan fleet, with everything, and rows of medals, whether he might be Bedouin peasant, swathed in bits of woolly stuff. Well, whatever he turned up in, the collective, ah, from the journalists, always rather pleased him. <laughs> uh, for the wrong reason, because we were going... Reuters have won the sweepstake again, have they? <laughs> yeah, be, having guessed which thing he'd turn up in. It was surreal, a surreal place. And he reduced his people to having to grapple with surreal life. And it was difficult. And they were frightened. Let's, um, let's move on to taking some questions. Uh, in the interest of allowing time for questions, I'm not going to... Uh, preface it with, with, with questions about um, from our own correspondent, but you know what Kate uh, does these days, and if anyone wants to ask about that or comment on that, you, you can. The, the lady uh, at the back there is the first. Kate, thank, thank you for that. Is there any country which fascinates you and whose people fascinate you more than others? Is there any one country, country that people? fascinates you more than others? Fascinates people? Either you've had to go to. Country or people? People. Um, or the country itself? No, I like ordinary people. I mean, that's, that's not a sort of, um, you know, s snobbish remark. Um, the, best, the best information, the most um, candid, the most from the heart um, information which you're going to be able to convey to viewers at home when you're interviewing people, listening to them, comes from people who care about something and are going to talk straight to you about it. Something which really doesn't happen now with the powerful, those in positions of public life, and those who exercise tremendous authority. The world of public relations has ruined that. People talk in conventional tones, don't make mistakes, don't, and are not candid now. They often don't speak from the heart. They merely, it's a set of bromides. It's that sort of stuff where you think, here we go again. Uh, most people have learned that that is what the media swallows in many cases and all they're prepared to give to them, partly because we're much less tolerant of little quirks, of oddnesses, or little slips. We are much less tolerant now, the media generally and the general public perhaps. And when you talk to people and say, what was it like after a major event where they have been present because their views matter, we don't. We are a medium. We are there with a microphone and a camera. My views on what has happened, m my take on it, is not of rel relevance. I don't live there. I didn't experience it. I want to get it from the people who were there. And you listen to people. You put your microphones in front of people who have lived through something, and they tell you. They tell you with determination, with, with vigor, sometimes with emotion, but they tell you straight. Go to the boss and he will have the boss's line. And so therefore, what I like is a crowd. I've always felt that. Within every crowd, there are people also who have, if you want just stories of a place, not at a dramatic time, if you just want to know what is going on, what life is like in a place, it's no good to see the head of public relations and the chief executive or the, or, or the president or all these things. Boring. They just issue you the tourist brochure. You go to the people standing in the fish queue. You go to the people um, playing in the football team. And you say, what's like life here, uh, life like here? Um, I did that once in, um, back in Tiananmen Square on the, um, 
anniversary on the day that Hong Kong was being handed back. A lot of the BBC team and all the other press were in Hong Kong. We were all in Beijing to see what the Chinese were making of it. And we saw these huge, huge dances and celebrations being organized for the evening. And there were thousands of young students all in you know, special sort of costumes. And they were all doing these traditional sort of Chinese dances and circling around and forming those patterns they do you know, with long live the Chinese revolution and things like that. And then you're all sitting on the ground chattering. And I asked my, um, we were filming surreptitiously in the square as you have to. And I said to my interpreter, who was a Kazakh, I said, Azalea. Go and ask them, you know, what it's like, and you know about Hong Kong and why they're here, you know. And it's great. And she said, "Oh, go and have a natter." So off she went, and she sat with them as they're eating their their buns. And she came back, and I said, "So?" And I said, "What did they say about Hong Kong?" And she said, "Where's that?" <laughs> she said, "They have no idea. They don't have a clue why they're here. They're just told to come here." I said, "Oh well, are they enjoying it?" She said, "Enjoying it." She said they hate it, just with all of that vehemence. And I said, what? She said, of course they do. They're teenagers. They think this is crap. <laughs> I said, thank you, Azalea. Oh, really? And you suddenly realize that what she is getting, she's a very, very good interpreter. She's a great, great girl. She's getting the real stuff. She's getting what it really is like. You got these teenagers sent to do all of this, you know, yay, hey, hey, you know, for the government and for everything in these sort of folksy dances. All I want to do is get home and listen to pop music smuggled in. That's what it's all about, very much so. Go listen to the voices in the crowd. Mm. Who would like to ask another question? Please, gentleman in the yellow shirt. With all that's going on in China at the moment with this dreadful explosion and also the situation in Korea, how do you think those people are feeling now? Because we don't see or hear very much on the news. We see that there's been an explosion, but there must be an awful lot more going on with the people that have been affected. And I can't believe only, what is it, seven or whatever it is have been killed. Of course there is, and John Sudworth, who's the excellent reporter who's out there, who speaks Chinese, um, he was the first reporter on. One of the first things he said was, there's nothing yet from the officials, nor is there likely to be which is going to give us the full story. I mean, he's a candid reporter and he knows what he's talking about. What you do get now is more information. The global um, situation we have now with media is that more people are likely to talk to you. More people are used to video cameras. They themselves have pictures. And even in a place like China, where there is vast suppression of internet activity, particularly anything of criticism, there is more coming out. But quite right, you don't get the full story. But we are getting there slowly. And ordinary citizens are now much more part of the media experience, if we can call it that. So we are learning more, but we're certainly, yeah, I agree, we're not learning the full story, no. Thank you, Andrew. We, you were sounding very hopeful, and that is good. And I did earlier today talk to you about the difference between China and India. That India, as the biggest democracy in the world, has more famine and difficulties and problems than China. So what is your view? Is your view that China is a failing state or a state that can actually do better than India? I think I'll get cautiously here. Um, I have uh, a new crystal ball, and nor am I an expert on the, on the economies of both countries. I, I am, though, a passionate believer, for all its flaws, as people always say, in democracy. I have much more faith in countries where people express themselves and can express themselves. Um, it's the root of human communication. It's all about empathy. It's all about knowing what human beings are saying. And I fear for countries where people are fearful of saying things and where things are suppressed. And therefore, um, uh, I see China as a, a country which will have problems when it comes to opinions, when it comes to opposite views to those in power. And I think that eventually does lead to a lot of problems, particularly with their attempts to suppress even the most advanced kind of communication via the internet, determined 
determined efforts to suppress, to keep things in the, in, in, in the line that the actual um, Communist Party wants. Whereas in India, I do remember everyone's to, everyone wants to get in on the act, everyone gets into the picture. The first time I went to India on a royal tour, um, a veteran uh, reporter said to me, oh, and don't forget, never mind the malaria tubs, take, a, take an orange box. I said, why? He said, well, you set yourself up, he said, as I have done, you see, in the most wonderful, wonderful dawn you get in India with this sort of fabulous smell, with a little wispy fire in the distance and a beautiful little village and lush greenery and so on. And you think, what a fabulous, fabulous background. So you stand there, your cameraman sets up in front of you, um, and he fiddles with the lens a bit. Oh, the light's getting a bit greater. He fiddles again, and then he sort of changes things, and he fiddles, he gets the microphone. And by the time he's actually sort of looked through the lens, he can't see a thing. That is because in front of you are at least 40 Indians <laughs> getting in on the act. It's a wonderful sort of enthusiastic, can we join in kind of nation, which isn't afraid of joining in, putting itself forward, even in the smallest village. And he said, the orange box is for you to stand on so the cameraman can shoot over them. <laughs> so from the very start, you're sort of convinced that this is a place where people have a view, who speak their views. I think there's always more future with that. I, I don't know whether we've had a famine in India lately either. Um, maybe we have. Um, how many of you here listen to from our own correspondent? Most people. So I'm expecting to be told to finish in a second. So before I do that, let me ask Kate, as I did earlier, about the exotic locations in which she records that program. Oh, I know. And I, this, is, this is taking, I'm afraid, this is actually tearing the veil from the program. I mean, it always is, you know, good morning. Um, and I don't say from. Partly Salford, because... From Salford. The, 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 no, never. I said, that's, that's not exotic. I have to say that. I can say it's coming from Sunderland, which isn't exotic either. Um, it's the point about the program is you hear about correspondents who are in all sorts of different places around the world. It really just muddies the water that the idiot who's stringing it all together should say, oh, and by the way, I'm in so-and-so. Did you want to know? Well, nobody really does, um, you know, um, except maybe my nearest and dearest who are wondering where I am. So you, we don't place it. I just do the program and voice it as a presenter. But I have done it from... Um, uh, I mean, never mind sort of broadcasting house in London and local radio stations around the country um, from Edinburgh uh, yesterday and from um, a ship in the middle of the uh, Atlantic Ocean uh, from um, uh, from somewhere very weird. Oh, yes, um, um, from, um, from inside um, the loo in a hotel in Macedonia which is the only quiet place to be, and also from uh, the top of a, a, a container in Basra in Iraq. I was sitting on top of the container one morning uh, with a pair of headphones on, a producer standing next to me uh, with a laptop, a foreign affairs producer, speaking to the producer back home, uh, with a rather surprised bunch of um, royal engineers, approximately 200 of them, in armoured vehicles all round us who just chugged into view and were met by a frantic producer shouting, could you shut up for some time? We're doing a radio programme. So they're all sat up round us, all these bizarre get guys in full kit. Um, lots of things going on round us in Basra, just end of the um, Second Gulf War. And there we were, and uh, we got them to say, shh. So I'm on top of this container. I'm speaking, and we're talking to the producer in London. He's saying, how is it in Basra? And I said, fine, fine. And he said, what's the studio like? <laughs> there are times when it's unwise to upset nice, calm producers in London by saying, well, actually, we're on top of it. Well, never mind. Well, the other place that's exotic, I can do it from my second floor bedroom as well. So there you go. Very it's good. the wonders of modern, modern technology. It's fantastic what there is today. It is terrific. What I hope is that people use the technology. We can do so much more than when I first came in.
to broadcasting. There's so much more in both radio and television and now with the internet. It is a terrific tool and I still passionately, passionately care that it's used properly and that it reflects not just what the rich, the famous, the glamorous, the celebrities, the powerful do. What I came into broadcasting is to reflect and to tell what everybody else is doing as well. Fantastic. I think that's a very good note on which to end. And I personally, next time I listen to from our own correspondent, will imagine that it's from our own water closet. Um, <laughs> so let me thank uh, Kate Ady very much for an illuminating and amusing and riveting uh, series of, uh, of, uh, of answers. And I hope, uh, I'm sure we want to express our appreciation for that. Thank you. Thank you.